Good day, grade 12s of South Africa. Welcome to Life Sciences with Mindset. And today, we are working through animal responses to the environment. So, we are going to be dealing with the nervous system. What is the nervous system? Well, it is all our nerves. It's the way our body works. Your nervous system controls every system in your body, either directly or indirectly. Okay, and remember that your nervous system <clears throat> always works in conjunction with the endocrine system. So chemical coordination. Uh, so you've got nervous coordination and chemical coordination. So first, we are going to do nervous coordination. Now, if we look at our slides, we say, right, we have this nervous system and it's amazing. And it controls the functioning of, look at this, all the systems in the body by reacting to stimuli, either external or internal, and then coordinating various activities. Now, we've got three types of nervous systems. <clears throat> We have the central nervous system, people. That means it's in the center. So that is the brain and the spinal cord. All right. Then we have the peripheral nervous system. Now, the word peripheral means on the outside, on the sides. It's peripheral. So your peripheral nervous system is all your sensory nerves, your nerves, your motor nerves, neurons, etc. And that's all the stuff that now feeds in to the central nervous system and in through the eyes and the ears, etc. All right, so this would be all your senses. Okay, they will give the information which then runs to the peripheral nervous system and that will go zhups to the central and up to the brain to interpret. And then the brain will respond and it will send messages to cause a reaction or a response. Think of this, if I took, I don't know, whatever, I've got a pen here, and I take this pen and I throw it at you, what is your reaction? You're going to do this or you're going to duck and put your hand up. Why? Your eyes, your sense organs, saw this object coming at you. And as it sees it, you, as, as it perceives this object coming at you, what do we want to do? We want to protect ourselves. So you close your eyes and you put your hand up to protect your face. Why? Your face has your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, and skin. So you've literally got your five external senses sitting here on this thing here. And you always protect your head. Why? It's got your brain. And your brain is the most important part of your nervous system. So you're going to do this. You're going to protect your head always. It's a normal, responsive reaction to any kind of stimulus. Right, so central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system, all the senses and all the nerves that work with the senses. And then your last but not least, and let's get a different color here, we'll use green, we have the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system, if you look at the word autonomic, auto always means on its own. It's automatic. You have an automatic washing machine. You put your washing in, you put your washing pad in, and you switch it on. All right? And it works automatically. So your autonomic nervous system is made up of two parts. It's made up of the sympathetic, it's sympathetic to you surviving, and the parasympathetic nervous systems. So sympathetic will stimulate and the parasympathetic will inhibit or relax. So when you are sitting and you're lying on the couch watching TV, your sympathetic nervous system is, has you in a completely reclining, relaxed state. But your sympathetic nervous system is if somebody barges in and you sit up and you think, ooh, 
Now that reaction would be your sympathetic nervous system. But it works automatically. You do not think about it. It is not controlled by the will. Where your sense organs are, okay? I can keep my eyes closed. And I can deliberately open my eyes to see something. If I can't make something out, I look closer. All right, so or if you can't hear something, you turn the sound up or you, you turn your head in that direction. We have our senses. So remember, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system is what's on the sides of the central nervous system, and then the autonomic nervous system, which works automatically. And the autonomic nervous system is made up of the sympathetic, stimulates, and the parasympathetic, to relax you. All right, now, how does the nervous system work? Our sense organs contain special cells called receptor cells. Now, the word receptor comes from receive. Okay? If I have a, if I have a, um, I don't know, let me think of something nice. If I have some perfume, and I take this perfume and I spray it on, you know those perfume cards that you get at the, at the shops? Spray it a bit. What am I doing? I bring it to my nose and I smell. The reason I can smell that perfume is because of the receptor cells in my olfactory area in my nose. The fact that you can see colors is because of those little receptors that sit inside your eye, okay, in the retina of the eye. Um, taste. You've got thousands, millions of little taste buds. And they are receptors. They receive the stimulus and convert it into an impulse. All right, so our sense organs contain special receptor cells because they receive the stimulus, okay? And they detect the changes, so that's your stimulus. The receptor cells take that stimulus and they convert it into a language the brain can understand. They convert it into a language that the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, can understand. Okay, and that, that language that the brain and the spinal cord can understand is called electrical impulses. <clears throat> that is the language of the brain and and spinal cord. All right, so that's the language it can understand. And it passes along nerve cells called neurons. So nerves are made up of thousands of little cells, like everything else in our body. And those little tiny little nerve cells are called neurons. So what's the process? We have got our senses. And in those senses, we have receptor cells. And those receptor cells receive the stimulus and it converts the stimulus into an impulse, which is the language of the brain. And the impulse now has to get to the central nervous system. And how does it get there? It goes along a highway. And that highway is made up of nerves. So receptor cells receive a stimulus. They convert the stimulus into an impulse the language of the brain, and the impulse travels along a roadway or a network called neurons, along those little nerve cells, okay? So, the message, which is this, this message, it's that electrical impulse, will then go to the brain, which will then process it, and the brain says, okay, well, I've received this message, and now you have to respond. There is always a response. Even doing nothing is a response. So the brain then decides, okay, how am I going to react? And the brain sends a message along neurons, again, a different road, but they're still neurons, to an effector organ. So a receptor, let's just move this, can I fit them both in? Your receptor will pick up the stimulus and convert it to an impulse and send it to the brain. The brain sorts out what needs to be done and the brain will then send a message, which is an impulse, or in the form of an impulse, along neurons to an effector organ. And that's either a muscle or a gland. Now, think about this. You are 
Well, you learners, you're always hungry, especially the boys. They are always, boys are always hungry. They can have a five course breakfast and they'll get up and half an hour later, they'll be hungry. You're walking along the road and you smell a bread shop. You know, that, you know what a bakery smells like and you can smell that fresh, fresh bread. What's happening? You can smell. How? Because those little particles of aroma are sitting in the air around you. That goes into your nose. In your nose, in the olfactory cells, they are receptor cells. And they convert that stimulus into an impulse. The impulse travels to the brain and the brain thinks, oh my goodness, that smells good. All right? And especially if you haven't eaten, what is the response? The response will be the brain will send impulses to your salivary glands and your salivary glands will start to produce saliva and your mouth will start to water. People, that is a perfect example of the way the nervous system works. Where you've got your, you've got your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. All right, so the brain will then take the impulse, the message, send it along the neurons to an effector organ. It is effected. It's what happens. It makes things happen. And that is either a muscle or a gland. All right. The effector organ will then give a response. So it will move or the gland will produce a hormone or your salivary glands will produce saliva or your sweat glands will uh, 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 make your skin sweat, etc, etc. But you will respond. All right. So it's actually so easy. Look at this. You've got the stimulus is perceived by your receptors. So it's received by the receptors. The receptors convert it to an impulse. The impulse travels along sensory neurons. Why? Because the receptors sit in your sense organs. Sensory neurons to the central nervous system. Remember, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord all right and the brain will then decide hmm I need to do something and the response will then pass along as an impulse because that's the language of the brain hey that's the language of the nervous system and the impulse travels to a motor neuron because remember a movement something's going to cause something to happen and motor means to move so a motor neuron and the motor neuron will then go to an effector and the effector is a muscle or a gland and you will have a response which is a reaction so walk past a bakery smell that wonderful smell of baking bread the brain thinks oh and the response is your mouth starts to salivate okay neurons now we're going to look at the different types of nerves neurons you've got your impulses which are the electronic messages enter a dendrite at one end travel along an axon to a terminal end plate on the other end now we need to look at the diagram which we'll do just after this now each neuron has the following and this is what you must know it has a cell body if it doesn't have a cell body, it's got no nucleus and it can't be controlled. All your, your, in, everything in your body, okay, every cell has a cell structure. It's got a cell body. And inside that cell body is a nucleus except for your red blood cells. They're the only cells in your body that do not have a nucleus. Okay, so we have a cell body and it contains a nucleus and it contains cytoplasm, just like a normal cell. Then you have dendrites. Now, dendrites are like little projections they, they're like little things that stick out and they pick up the impulses and the impulse then pass down the axon and the axon that's a long sort of wiry thing and that is what the impulse will travel along so let's look at our diagram here's a neuron structure there's your cell body with the little nucleus and it's got these little projections called dendrites okay then you've got this long axon and sitting around the axon, you've got these little wrappings. They, they, it would be like um, if, if I took this pen and I wrapped my fingers around it. You see how my fingers are? This would be the axon. And each one of my fingers wrapping around it like that would be these little structures. 
And these little structures here are, are, are um, Schwann cells. And the Schwann cell contains a myelin sheath. And it's that myelin sheath that has the ability to fix and repair the axon. So when we look at neurons that are in the, in, in the spinal cord, those don't have a myelin sheath around it. And that is why if you damage your spinal cord, it can't repair itself. Whereas if I damage any other cells in my body, those little myelin sheets will try and fix the axon so that the impulse can travel along. Remember, it's like a road. Your, your, your neurons are like roads um, or like a highway. And if, for example, there is an earthquake or, or, I don't know, something happens and the road breaks and people can't get through, the cars can't drive over the brake, um, the cars can't get from point A to point B because there's a break in the road. Now, that would be the same as this axon being damaged. All right. So we have the cell body, the dendrites with the nucleus in the cell body. And then we have this long structure called an axon. And what the axon does is it is lined around it with a myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath can repair it and fix it and help it. And then the little gap in between the little, no, a little Schwann cells, because that's a Schwann cell, there's one, there's one, there's one. The little gap in between is called the node of Ranvier. People, and you must know this. Now, we took this slide from the world of teaching, and there are some beautiful PowerPoint presentations there, but it's very American, so it doesn't always have everything that we need. But this slide comes from there, and it's, I think it's a gorgeous slide. Okay, now, at the end of this axon, which isn't drawn here, okay, let's just finish that little structure there, you're going to have something that looks like this. And that is your terminal end plate. And this terminal end plate, this is a motor neuron, so your terminal end plate will end either in a muscle or a gland. Okay, so <clears throat> now the types of neurons. We get three types of neurons. The first type of neuron we get are sensory neurons. And what happens is the receptor picks up the stimulus. It converts that stimulus into an impulse. Now, that's the language, that's the messenger, and that language, that little impulse, has to get to the central nervous system. How does it do it? It travels along a road. That road is a sensory neuron, and lots of sensory neurons make up a sensory nerve. So, now look at this. They are unipolar. Uni means one, or bipolar, two. Sensory neurons always conduct impulses to the central nervous system people. So sensory neurons, it's from your senses, it goes to the central nervous system. It only ever travels in one direction. It's like a main highway. You'll have two or three or four or five lanes travel in one direction and a big thick wall and then you have two or three or four or five lanes traveling in the opposite direction. Okay, so your sensory neurons always travel to the central nervous system. Your motor neurons, are multipolar, in other words, they have lots of poles. And those neurons always carry impulses away from the central nervous system. In other words, it's the other side of the highway. Now, if you can think of normal, everyday things that you have in your life, and you use them to understand your life sciences, I promise you now, it'll be so much easier to learn. So remember, sensory neurons, carry impulses from the sense organs along one side of the highway to the central nervous system. And your motor neurons are the other side of the highway. They carry impulses from the central nervous system to your effectors, all right? But then, what do we have on a normal highway? We have on-ramps and off-ramps, don't we? Now, if we have on-ramps and off-ramps, what do you think those on-ramps and off-ramps are? They are so that if I am going along the highway and I want to go and I think, oops, I need to go back, how do I get? I can't just chuck my car across that barrier. What do I need to do? Because I'll cause the most amazing accident. I need to take the off-ramp and I go over a bridge and I come back onto the highway. All right, those would be your connector neurons.
and also in the brain. You've got the sensory neurons taking information to the brain, okay? And then you've got the brain sending messages away from the brain to the effectors. So something has to link the two here, and that's where you'll connect a neuron. So sensory neurons, motor neurons away, and connector neurons will connect the sensory to the motor. That's like your on and your off ramp. Okay, and a little bridge in between, so we put a little bridge there. All right, so they multipolar and they connect it to the sensory neurons and the motor neurons and the spinal cord and in the brain. All right, so they sort of connect the whole lot. And here are the different types of neurons. Multi, your, your motor neuron always carries impulses away from the brain. So there is your brain, okay, away from the brain. And you've got your sensory neuron. Now this one here, you see there's only one pole, there's only one little connection here. This would be unipolar. If it was bipolar, it would look like this. And your cell body would be here. So it's got one, two poles. You see there? And your unipolar looks like that. So there's only one little connection there. So one pole, Unipolar, two poles, bipolar. All right, so that's a unipolar, it's a sensory neuron, and it's going to take impulses from the receptor that converts the stimulus to an impulse. That impulse travels along the sensory neuron till it gets to its terminal implant, so it's going to go in this direction. And then you've got your interneuron or your connector neuron. Now, connector, you're connecting two things, all right? Inter means between. And what is inter? It's also connecting. So you can either use the term interneuron or connector neuron. It depends on your teachers and what textbooks you're using. All right, so connector neuron, interneuron means exactly the same thing. But look, they also multipolar. Look at that. Lots and lots of dendrites there. So motor neurons are multipolar. Sensory neurons are unipolar, and inter or connector neurons are multipolar as well. We can also call motor neurons efferent. Efferent neurons. Why? Because they take impulses to an effector. All right? And also you can think of the fact that they exit the brain and spinal cord. They exit the central nervous system. Whereas here, what have I got? I've got my sensory neuron is called, also, can also be called an afferent neuron. And think of A for afferent and A for arrive. And what do they do? They arrive at the brain and spinal cord. So afferent neurons are sensory neurons and efferent neurons exit the brain and carry impulses away from the brain. And then your connector or interneurons. As I said, it depends on what textbook you're using and quite literally where your teacher was trained. Because um, some universities and colleges will teach afferent and efferent uh, neurons and others will teach sensory and motor neurons. But you've got to know that a motor neuron is efferent and a sensory neuron is afferent. Now, a synapse. People, very important, okay? I'm gonna put NB here, why? Because a synapse is the point where an impulse passes from the terminal branch of one neuron to the dendrite of the next. So it's as that impulse is going, it travels through the one neuron and then it's gotta to get to the next neuron and it's gotta to get to the next neuron. So what happens? Here, neurons never ever touch. They never ever touch, okay? So. There's a gap, and that gap is called the synaptic gap. And that synaptic gap means that while that gap is there, an impulse can never travel in the opposite direction. Can you imagine if the impulse now goes that way, and then it decides, oh, no, no, hold on, I want to go this way. And, oh, no, 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 I want to go this way. Oh, no, no, I want to go this way. And that's literally what happens when people have Parkinson's disease. The little impulse is going, forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards and what does it do it causes the muscles to contract and relax 
and that causes people to shake and that's what Parkinson's is all about it's a neurotransmitter that doesn't work so the impulse just goes backwards and forwards all right so we don't want that okay that that's a no-no we don't want that what we do want is an impulse to travel perfectly from one neuron to the next because the neurons don't touch there's a little gap that they have to go through okay so we, what we've got there is chemical, neuro, they're called chemical neuro, means part of the brain, transmitters. And what does a transmitter do? It transmits, it moves it. Now we've got chemical trans, neurotransmitters called acetylcholine. We've got dopamine. Come on, you must have heard of dopamine. That's a feel-good one. We've got serotonin. If you don't have enough serotonin, you actually end up being a miserable person. Um, you... <coughs> Your body releases serotonin when you eat chocolate. Come on, is there a human being out there that doesn't love chocolate, hey? So when you eat chocolate and you feel, mm, this, this is so good, okay? That lack of feeling you get, okay, that's because of serotonin. And if you don't have enough serotonin, you won't sleep properly. Serotonin relaxes you. It makes you feel good and warm and cozy and all bushy-tailed and bright-eyed. All right, so acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin help to transmit impulses from one neuron across the gap to the next. Okay, this ensures that impulses can only ever travel in one direction. <coughs> Sorry, once the neurotransmitter has crossed the gap, enzyme in the post means after, postsynaptic side destroys it. Neurotoxins, now neuro, nervous system. Toxin, toxins are bad things. Such as strychnine, which is a poison, is used in rat poison and it causes the impulses to become conducted across and back over the synapses, resulting in uncontrolled muscle spasms. Okay, before we go on, I want to show you something. Imagine this. This is the end of one neuron. And this is the end of another neuron. Okay? This is the dendrite. So the impulse is traveling in this direction. Okay, best way to think of it. In here, we've got a whole bunch of little mitochondria. Why do we need mitochondria? Because they produce the energy that is needed to transmit an impulse from this side to that side. This here is your synaptic gap, okay? And we've got little vesicles. And those vesicles produce the neurotransmitter. All right, now I'm going to tell you a story. And anyway, I think once I finish the story, you will remember this for the rest of your lives. Okay? Imagine we have two islands. This island here has only got guys on it. And this island has got girls. Now, guys want to get across shark infested water. These are sharks. And these sharks are great white sharks. And they've got teeth like you cannot believe. So these guys can't just get in the water and swim across. Okay? So what do they do? They decide, hold on. We're going to use all the energy we have. And we are going to build little boats. So, and they go into these little vesicles. Vesicles, sorry, vesicles are like little garages. And in there... They build the most beautiful little boats. Little boats with a little sail. And at least that way, they can get across the water so the sharks don't eat them. Okay. Here's your mitochondria. And the mitochondria provides the energy, the ATP, to do this. Okay. So the vesicles in those little garages, they produce these wonderful little boats. So now the chap which is the impulse, okay? He can come along, he gets in his little boat, and the little boat sails across the shark-infested waters so that the sharks, which is the synaptic gap, can't harm him. Across he goes, gets to the other side here, and out he gets, and he goes on his merry way to go and look for these gorgeous girls that inhabit this island. He's got, you can see, he's got a big smile on his face. Okay. All right. So off he goes. But now, we don't want the girls to get on this boat and go back to the guys over here. Because that just won't do. Girls wait for the guys to come across to their island. So, 
we need to make sure that none of the girls can go across. So the girls have got an army of police. And these police girls come along, okay, and they have a huge big hammer and they smash this boat to pieces. And what is that? That is an enzyme. So, your boat is your neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter carries the impulse to, across the synaptic gap, our shark infested waters. To the other side, very safely. The impulse then carries on, on his way. But over here, we have an enzyme. And that enzyme smashes this boat up. It smashes the neurotransmitter so that the impulse cannot go back again. We don't want this impulse back. The girls want the guy to stay here. They don't want him to go back. When people have Alzheimer's, this enzyme is no longer produced on this side, on the postsynaptic gap or postsynaptic side. So what happens is an impulse then moves that way and that way. So the impulse will move in both directions and that is what causes the muscles to contract and relax, causing the shaking, uncontrollable shaking that people with Alzheimer's have. So people, remember this. Your synaptic gap is incredibly important. Why? Because it separates the neuron, from, uh, the two neurons, so that the impulse cannot travel backwards and forwards. We want that impulse to travel in one direction. If it's coming from the uh, peripheral nervous system, we want it to go to the spinal cord and the brain. We want to channel it to the central nervous system. Okay? Messages from the central nervous system we want to channel away to effectors which are our organs or our glands. So the impulses must travel in one direction, otherwise we're going to have chaos. Imagine we've got a highway and cars are traveling in both directions on both sides of that highway. Can you imagine the kind of accidents we're going to have? Never. Cars on the one side travel in this direction, cars on this side travel in that direction. We have an orderly way of doing things. Okay, so that is how we have it here. So, synaptic gap is this gap, shark infested waters. We have vesicles which produce the neurotransmitters, which are the little boats. The impulse gets carried across the shark infested waters. When it gets to the other side, the little impulse carries on its way to go find all these gorgeous girls. And we've got the policemen that come along and smash up that boat so that it can't take this chap back again. All right, if you remember that, I promise you now you'll have no problem with that whole synapsis and how it works. All right, here we go. The central nervous system. We're looking at the brain. The brain is protected by three uh, at least by a bone. That's this hard thing here called a cranium. A skull, remember, is everything. So a skull is your cranium and these facial bones that you have here. All right, and your jaw. This is all part of the skull. But it's the cranium here that's thicker and it protects the brain. It must, because your brain is so incredibly important. Now, just underneath that, this, this, this hard bone structure that you have are three membranes. Now, the membrane that's closest to the outside is called the dura mater because it is the most durable. Then we have the pia mater, which covers the brain. All right? Just like the skin of a pea, pea mater, covers that soft, mushy stuff on the inside of the pea. So the pea mater covers the brain. The dura mater is right against the bone. And in between the two, we have something called the arachnoid. And the arachnoid sits there. And between the arachnoid and the pea mater, you find fluid. And because it's part of the brain and the spinal cord, we call it the cerebrospinal fluid. So we have the bone. In fact, I'm going to go and show you the diagram. Um, this is all wada wada. There we go. Here's the diagram. You've got the cranium bone, nice and thick. Then we have the dura mater because it is durable. That's how you'll remember it. It's durable. 
You have the arachnoid, which sits just below that. And we have the pea mater. Just think of the skin of a pea, covers all that soft, mushy stuff on the inside. So the pea mater is right against the brain. And then in between the two here is a cavity between the arachnoid and the pea mater. We have the cerebro spinal fluid. Okay, it's between the brain and the spinal cord. And that fluid you find all the way around the brain and you find it around the spinal cord, in the, in the um, spinal cord as it runs to the vertebra. All right, now, you have to know all the parts of the brain and the functions. So forget about all your notes, forget about all the things that the textbook says. Take a diagram. If you don't have a nice diagram, draw the brain yourself and then write down the labels and the functions and learn it all on one sheet, people. This is the easiest way to learn it. So let's start on this side. Got the cranium, the dura mater, the arachnoid, the pia mater, and between the arachnoid and the pia mater, the cerebrospinal fluid. You've got the fissure of which comes down here, and you've got different points all over on the brain, which are for different perceptions. You've got the corpus callosum, and now think about this. Corpus callosum keeps the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain together. It holds the two hemispheres together, so it keeps them close. And that's how you remember, so it's the corpus callosum. And that corpus callosum is also where the crossover takes place. So what I perceive on the right side of my body is picked up and interpreted on the left side of my brain. And what I perceive on the, I mean, the right, what I perceive on the left side of my brain is interpreted and perceived by the right side of my brain. And all of that happens at the corpus callosum because it keeps the left and the right hemispheres close together. All right, I hope you remember that. Now, we then got in here is a very funny little structure. This little thing that sticks out here is called the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland is incredibly important for when we get to chemical coordination and the endocrine system, which is in two sections time, okay? But for now, you must know it's the pituitary gland, but the pituitary gland is physically linked to this structure called the hypothalamus. Now, ladies, let me tell you this. If a chap says to you, oh, my darling, I love you with all my heart. He's not worth it. And you're all going to say to me, Kathy, have you gone mad? And I'm going to say, no, listen to this. Your heart just pumps blood all over your body. Really, it's not such a major thing. You can put a pump in there and it'll do exactly the same job. It's nothing exciting. Okay, but the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is the structure that keeps you alive. It is the structure that gives meaning to your life. Look at this. The hypothalamus is responsible for temperature regulation. Hypothalamus is responsible for water balance. The hypothalamus is responsible for and regulates the smooth muscle via the autonomic nervous system. So every organ, every gland, including the heart, is regulated here by the hypothalamus. It regulates your metabolism. It regulates the pituitary gland. It regulates your need for sleep, people. It regulates your sex drive. It regulates everything about you is your hypothalamus. So guys, you want to win a, guy, a girl's heart from now on, when you end your little love letters, you'll write there, and I love you with my entire hypothalamus. And if you do that, I promise you, that girl will know you adore her above all else. Because the hypothalamus controls everything that you are and everything that happens in your body is the hypothalamus. Not the heart. It's the hypothalamus. All right, so you have to know this. This is an NB. And also that the hypothalamus is physically linked to the pituitary gland. All right, then we have a little round lump here called the pons veroli. And what that is, is it's a bridge between the brain and the spinal cord and this structure here called the cerebellum. All right, so it's, it, your pons veroli links the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and 
this your spinal cord and this medulla oblongata why so that your body knows exactly what's happening where it's a coordinator it's like your pons viroli is like a, a project manager it makes sure that everyone knows what's going on and everything happens properly all right then we have the cerebrum now the cerebrum is this main part of the brain here okay and the cerebrum is made up of the cortex and in that cortex you're going to have a whole bunch of gray matter okay so the cerebral cortex is gray matter and then inside here we have the cerebrum medulla which is made up of white matter but for here we've just got the gray matter and why because of all the cell bodies of those little neurons now in here we have our, our cerebral medulla and that's where all the white matter or the fibers are so we have white matter which is the fibers or the axons and we have the gray matter which has got all the cell bodies now the cerebrum people here the cerebrum is responsible for the perception of all your senses, your sense of sight, your sense of smell, your sense of taste, um, and a, a sense of hearing and sense of touch. Okay, all your senses sits in your cerebrum. Um, higher intelligence, cerebrum. Every single thing in your body, the perception of something. Now that nonsense where they say, oh, you know what? We only use one tenth of our brains is absolute nonsense. We use one tenth of our brain at any one time, okay? But my goodness, you're using this tenth here and then you're using a tenth here and maybe you're using a fifth, uh, um, one twenty or five twentieths here and five twentieths here and two twentieths here and three twentieths there, whatever. You're using at any one time, you're using parts, lots of parts of your brain which make up about 10%, okay? Um, but it changes the minute I start walking or I get up off this chair or um, someone gives me a fright or I watch something and I start crying on TV I watch something on TV and I start crying all those things you're using different parts of your brain all the time it's going ch -ch 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 -ch. all right so yeah we only use one tenth it doesn't mean the rest of our brain at that time is null and void okay so we need to look after our brains and every time you take drugs or do stupid things like get drunk you're destroying brain cells and they can't be replaced people they cannot be replaced and that's a sad part of it all right so cerebrum perception of our senses higher intelligence the fact that we can think reasoning memory if you look at a rat's forehead a rat or a sheep their forehead is like this okay that's their head so a sheep will have a nice little, okay, that looks more like a pig's ear. Um, or you'll have a rat will have a sharpish ear like that. There's the little nose. There's the little eye. Now you can see why I didn't take up art at school. But anyway, so there's your animal. Look at this flat forehead here. Now you look at a human being. We've got a forehead, and then we've got our eye, and the nose, and the mouth, and the chin. Okay. Okay. Look at this here. It's not flat like that, like a baboon. It goes up here. And this is where higher intelligence sits, in the front of the cerebellum. Okay, so higher intelligence memory sits here in the frontal lobe. All right, so that's what the, the cerebrum's for. Perception of senses, higher intelligence, reasoning, etc. The cerebellum is for balance, equilibrium, and muscle tone, and you must know that, okay? Here, it's called the tree of life, and the inside here is white matter. I'm going to make it pink. So here you've got your gray matter, which is actually pink. The reason they call it gray matter and white matter is when you put it in formaldehyde, this tissue goes like a, a grayish, pinkish, like a dusty pink color, okay? So I suppose the guys way back when that came up with this were a little bit colorblind. I mean, we all know guys don't have the same color sense as girls do generally. I mean, there's the odd chap that does have a bit of color sense, but mostly girls understand color far more than guys do. Although having said that, your best designers in the world are men. But anyway, we're not going to go into a male-female thing here. Okay, what I've colored here in, in sort of pink, that's the gray matter. And this here this line should extend to there and that would be your white matter 
that's the middle, that's what looks like a tree. All right, so why? It's made up of the fibers or axons. And the gray is always made up of the cell bodies. So the gray matter here will be the cell bodies. And the white matter, this pen is so difficult when I want to write little. And the white matter would be your axons or your fibers. All right, people, then we've got the spinal cord. What's its job? It conducts all nerve impulses to and from the brain. Your spinal cord is like your highway. Okay, it's like a huge, big main highway. And we also get what's called a reflex arc there, which we'll go into more detail now. And then you've got your very middle here, you've got your central canal. Then the medulla oblongata, let's just get our little rat's ear out of the way here. Your medulla oblongata is controls your heartbeat rate, your breathing rate, um, reflexes like peristalsis, all of that is regulated by this little bump over there called the medulla oblongata. You've got to know this diagram. Please learn it well. All right, question one. Let's see if you've been listening. This is adapted from various exam papers. I took an old exam paper and I modified some of the questions. So study the diagram and answer the questions that follow. Now, first thing you do when you get a diagram, people, first thing is you label any missing labels or any things that they, they put onto the diagram. So number one, that's your cerebrum. Number two, it's this little flappy little round thing. It looks like a walnut. That's called the pituitary gland. Okay? So your cerebrum, your pituitary. Number three is this little round. So it's a cerebrum. This little thing here is called your cerebellum. Okay? Little brain. In fact, in Afrikaans, it's called the Klein brain. So it's cerebrum, cerebellum. Bellum, little one. All right, then number four. Now it's the second bump, and the second bump is the medulla oblongata. And what does the medulla oblongata regulate? It regulates your heartbeat rate, your breathing rate, peristalsis. And have you ever tried to, I mean, if you're running and your heart rate goes up, have you tried to breathe slowly? It doesn't work. Okay, it does not work. And if your breathing rate goes up, your heart rate goes up. If your heart rate goes down, your breathing rate goes down. They work hand in glove. And then number five would be the spinal cord. Okay, so one is the cerebrum, two is the pituitary gland, three is the cerebellum, four is the medulla oblongata, and number five is the spinal cord. Question one, identify parts one to five. We have just done that. Okay. Um, part, uh, uh, question two. Number one is made up of two similar halves. Okay. Number one was the cerebrum. Is made up of two similar halves. How are these two halves attached to one another? Come on, people. You've got to remember this. By means of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum keeps the left and the right hemispheres callose and that is where we have the crossover from perceived in the right and uh, at least we pick it up in the right and perceived in the left side of the brain and here. So if a person for example has a stroke on the left side of their brain it affects the movement of their right side of their body and vice versa. Okay, question three. What type of tissue is controlled by number three? So number three was, let's just go back here. Number three was the cerebellum. Now remember the cerebellum is in charge of balance, equilibrium, and muscle tone. So what type of tissue is controlled by number three? Okay, so let's think. It will be all the skeletal muscles. Why? Because remember, number three is responsible for balance, equilibrium, and muscle tone. And because it's responsible for that, it will be your skeletal muscles. 
Now, what's the difference between balance, equilibrium, and muscle tone? If you don't have muscle tone, your muscles will not hold you up. Okay? Um, that's number one. Number two, balance is so that you don't fall over onto your nose. That's balance. So this is balance, and think of this as equilibrium. So we need balance, and we need equilibrium. And if we've got those two factors, we can do nothing without our muscles and muscle tone. Think of a baby that's just learning to sit. Have you ever watched a baby that's just learning to sit? You have this little thing sitting there, and their little legs are out in front of them, and they sit there and they go, and, and they wobble around like this until they eventually go, oops, and they fall over. What are they doing? Their muscle tone is not yet strong enough to help them balance and have equilibrium. And that is what we have once we have developed and gone past the age of six months where we're learning to sit. Okay, so it will always control the, 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 the skeletal muscles. Be careful how you read the question because I can tell you now, a lot of learners here would have put balance, equilibrium, and muscle tone. It's not. It's the skeletal muscles that are controlled by the cerebellum as well as your ears. The, the, the sensory organ of your ear, like for example, the cochlea, okay, and the utriculus and the saculus, which people we are also going to do because we have to do the ears in detail. All right, now, <clears throat> name two functions of number four, okay, so we go back. Number four was the medulla oblongata. So we need two functions. There were plenty. What does it do? It regulates our breathing rate and depth. It regulates our heartbeat rate. It regulates the vasoconstriction and vasodilation of all our blood vessels in our body. So therefore, the medulla oblongata regulates our blood pressure because if you've got this blood in your body and all your blood vessels constrict, it means that there's going to be a lot of pressure because you've got all this blood trying to fit through that small little opening. Whereas if you have vasodilation, the blood vessels open up and they get bigger. Now, how do you remember the difference between dilation and constriction? If I take my two hands and I put them around your neck like this and I go, I'm going to be constricting your throat, aren't I? Constricting. Um, a boa constrictor is a snake that wraps it around you and it crushes you, okay? So, if, it, if a blood vessel constricts, it gets smaller. It constricts. Whereas, if something's dead, it just, it's dead. It's relaxed, okay? And it's big. All right. Constriction is to go small. Dilate is to go big. And if you remember <coughs> the difference, you won't ever go wrong. We've done our two functions. List three ways in which the brain is protected. Now, people, I mean, really, hello. What's this? It's a skull. It's your skull here. So your facial bones in the front here, okay? Your jawbone, not really that important. You could live without it. It would be very difficult to chew, but you could live without it. It's these bones here that protect the brain at the back, okay? You've got the, the cranium, the bones of the cranium, and the bones of the skull protect the brain. Then what have we also got? We've got, it protects it against physical injury. Then what have we also got? We've got those membranes. So we've got the dura mater on the outside, the pia mater right against the brain, the, against the brain tissue, and in between we've got the arachnoid. And our third thing is between the arachnoid and the pia mater, we have the cerebrospinal fluid. So we have the bones of the skull and the cranium, especially the cranium. We have the cerebrospinal fluid, which acts as a cushion. And we have the three membranes, the dura mater, arachnoid, and the pia mater. And by the way, you know, you, you get thing, a, a disease called meningitis. And meningitis is from those three membranes, because the proper name for those membranes are meninges. And when they become infected, we end up with meningitis, because those membranes are affected, okay? All right, spinal cord. 
very, very, very important as well. We've got the spinal cord is protected by, first of all, the vertebra. We all know the vertebra. You can run your finger down your back and you'll feel all the little lumps at the back here. Those are your vertebra. And then we have the cerebrospinal fluid, which is make sure that everything is all nice and cozy. Now, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. In other words, as your little spinal cord comes down like this, you've got 31 nerves that come in from where your coccyx is there. Just a little bit up, you've got 31 spinal nerves that come in. Okay, the spinal cord is the pathway of all impulses that are conducted to and from the brain. Okay, if anything comes from anywhere, it's got to go, unless it's coming from here. But everywhere else, it's going to go into the spinal cord to the brain. Into the spinal cord to the brain. All right, also possesses all reflex actions. Now, a reflex action, okay, um, let's think. Victor Matfield, one of the best rugby players this country has ever produced, in my opinion, that is. Okay, gorgeous, big, beautiful Victor Matfield. And somebody throws something at him. What is he going to do? He's immediately going to respond. That people is not what's called a reflex action. That is a learned reflex. Now, how do we tell the difference between a learned reflex and a natural reflex? A learned reflex will be something that a baby, when it is born, will not do. Okay. So, um, in other words, if I take a brand new baby, that baby is like hours old, and I take a feather and I tickle its foot, it's going to move its toes like that. And if I tickle on top of its toes, it'll move its toes back. The same, one of the tests they do with the baby to see if its responses are normal is, you know, the baby's little hands are always like this when they're newborns. And you tickle them over here, the hand will open. You tickle them inside here, the hand will close. Sucking is a natural reflex. Okay, coughing. A brand new boy, baby can cough. A brand new baby can sneeze. A brand new baby's eyes will tear if the air is too dry. Okay? All of those are natural reflexes, but we have learned reflexes. Oh, and if I take a pin and I prick a baby, it's going to pull its hand away. Or if I take one of those, those funny little triangular hammer kind of things and I knock it under its, not hurt it, but I mean I just tap it at its knee, its knee is going to kick out. All right. Those are natural reflexes. The body responds without thinking. A learned reflex would be Victor Matfield catching a ball. Okay. Um, it would be a really good rugby player sidestepping. They're anticipating and they will react quickly. That's a learned reflex. Um, a cricket ball coming at you, you're going to put your hand up and catch it. Or not, you're going to duck. Depends on if you're a girl or a guy. Okay. Um, kicking a soccer ball. All of those things are learned reflexes. So please be careful. When we talk about life sciences and we talk about the spinal cord and reflex actions and reflex arcs, we talk about natural reflexes, not learned reflexes. So all you need to do is think, will a brand new baby respond in the same way as I do? And if your answer is yes, then it is a spinal cord reflex and not a learned reflex. Okay, so here we go. We have all the processes are reflex actions. Now, please, people, your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nerves, nerve impulses are conducted along the spinal cord to all the, all the organs. So we'll go through, remember, this is part of your autonomic nervous system. We've got the central nervous system, which is what we're doing now. You've got the peripheral nervous system, which picks up impulses and stimuli from outside and from your sensory organs, okay? external and internal receptors, by the way, and then you have your autonomic nervous system. And the only way you're going to get messages to all the organs is via the spinal cord. Alrighty, the reflex arc. Now, what is the difference in a reflex arc and a reflex action? The reflex arc is the path traveled by the nerve impulses. The reflex action is a result of that. Okay, so reflex arc, you must know this, NB, it's a definition, is the path traveled by the nerve impulses. It's a rapid automatic response to a stimulus that is received by a sensory organ to ensure a quick response. The reflex arc 
will cause a reflex action, allowing the body to respond very quickly to protect itself. Okay, if you're walking along and um, you hear this noise next to you and this long grass, your immediate reaction is going to be Okay, why? Because you think it's a snake. All right. Or to think, ah, turn and run. That would be a learned reflex. Why? Because if you have a baby, a brand newborn baby, and you put it there, a snake can hiss to its heart's content. The baby is not going to respond because it's, it doesn't know to be scared of snakes. But if I take a pin and I prick that baby's finger, that baby's going to pull its finger away, just like you will. In other words, that would be a natural reflex, which is as a result of a reflex arc. Now, what is a reflex arc? Look here. There's the finger, okay? And the, there's a pain stimulus there. So whether you've pricked it, whether you've burnt it, doesn't matter. There is a pain receptor. And the pain receptor converts the stimulus, remember, stimulus into an impulse. And the impulse will travel along a sensory neuron, goes through the sensory neuron's unipolar cell body. It goes in through the dorsal root. Dorsal means the back. Okay, so it's the dorsal root, and it, there's a synapse there, and it goes into the connector neuron, and then there's another little synapse here, and then it goes into the motor neuron, and it gets relayed to the muscle, okay, via a motor neuron, and the, the muscle will then be the effector. It will respond. Okay, so the impulse will go in through the dorsal root and out through the ventral root. People, if we stood on all fours as human beings, our back would be up and our tummy would be down. This is our ventral side. And this here, where our back is, is our dorsal side. Okay, so the impulse will go. This is the process and listen because they can ask you to write this in an exam. Follow the path of the stimulus and they take all these labels out. Okay. <coughs> ah, I'm really throwing pens around. Prick the finger. Pain receptors in the finger convert the stimulus to an impulse. The impulse travels along, because it's coming from your senses, sensory neuron to the spinal cord. Now that's pain, okay? And this happens so quickly. Spinal cord impulse travels to a connector neuron, and from the connector neuron, it travels along a motor neuron, Oops. and it will cause the muscles to contract to pull your hand away from that painful stimulus. All right. Even if you know something's hot, you can see the stove is on. And you take your finger and you put your finger on that stove, that red hot stove plate. I promise you now, no sooner as your finger touched and your hand will be pulling away, before you even feel the pain. That is how quickly this response takes. All right, you've got to know the reflex arc. The knee jerk action, same thing. Sitting along, you, what you can do at home is sit, like, sit, sit with your legs bent and get a sister or a brother or your mom or your dad to take even, you know, those plastic rulers. And all you do is, is you tap into the knee here with that plastic ruler here. Now, here we're using a proper patella uh, um, hammer, which is used by your, I, I think they call it a, a patella apparatus, used by a doctor and they do this to check reflexes and they'll, they'll, they'll tap over here just, oops, just not hard hey just a little tap and what happens <coughs> the sensory neurons uh, and the receptors the stretch receptors will c convert the stimulus to an impulse impulse travels along the sensory neuron through the unipolar cell body and it goes to a connector neuron Okay, the connector neuron or interneuron as they've called it here, 
um, then you have another synapse which joins to the motor neuron and the motor neuron ends in the muscle and what does the muscle do the muscle will contract and it'll make your leg go bloops and you'll uh, your knee will actually jerk and your foot is going to come up okay question two study the following diagrams and answer the questions that follow okay what have we done here we've cut through the spinal cord first rule with a diagram, what is rule number one? Rule number one is fill in the labels. Now, if we look at these labels, remember that in the brain, we had, in the, core, in the cerebrum, we had the cell bodies, and we called it gray matter. Um, and in the middle, the medulla of the cerebrum, okay, or that cerebral structure, in the medulla, we had the white matter. Now, if we look Let's go back to our diagram here. Oh man. Here. You see this is shaded gray? Because that's where the gray matter is. In other words, that's where the cell bodies are. Okay? And the white matter is going to be where the axons are. The axons or the fibers of the nerves. All right. So, remember that. The inside here is gray matter the outside is white matter in the brain it's the other way around in the brain on the outside is the gray matter and on the inside here is the white so that's white matter and that's gray matter so it's the opposite way around so that you never ever get confused so if we look at our diagram okay a would be the white matter remember it's on the outside in the spinal cord and b would be gray matter and c is that very very central part there because remember this whole thing has the spinal cord so that little thing in the right in the middle of the spinal cord okay is going to call be called the central canal and the central canal what does it have inside it inside it's got cerebrospinal fluid and you know what when they do a, a lumbar punch you know when somebody has a lot of pressure on their brain or they've got meningitis some one of the symptoms and I thought the only symptom there are hundreds of symptoms but the one of the symptoms of meningitis is you need to be able to put your chin on, on your chest here and if a person has meningitis everything is so swollen that they can't extend their neck enough and meningitis just feels like a really 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 bad migraine all right so some people don't worry about it and then two three days later they're dead so please if you ever get really 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 bad headaches and it's for longer than a day and you can't put your chin on your chest go and have it checked out because it could be meningitis all right so that cerebrospinal fluid sits over there now question one identify parts a b and c we've done that okay question two state two ways in which the spinal cord is protected now people really just think about it you've got the bones just like with the skull you've got the bones and you're also going to have the three membranes which run all the way around the spinal cord and you are going to have the cerebrospinal fluid so there are three and it's exactly the same as with the brain all right describe what happens in the reflex arc as a result of a reflex action now we're going to do this and we're going to go back to this diagram or let's do this one okay this is it and that's for 10 marks you say okay whether it's a knee-jerk reaction, whether it's pricking the finger, there is a stimulus. The stimulus is converted to an impulse by receptors. Okay? The receptors, okay, the impulse, sorry, will then move along a sensory neuron through the sensory neuron here, through the cell body or past the cell body of the sensory neuron unipolar cell body of the sensory neuron and a synapse is formed with a connector neuron 
The impulse then travels through the connector or interneuron and a second synapse is formed with the motor neuron. The motor neuron conducts the impulse along to an effector, which is in this case a muscle. All right, causing the muscle to contract and move the part of the body away from the stimulus. And that is your mark. That's 10 marks. So, stimulus is perceived. It's converted into an impulse by the receptors. The impulse passes along the sensory neuron in through the dorsal root. Okay? In through the dorsal root, you have the first synapse to interneuron or connector neuron. Second synapse into the motor neuron and the impulse travels along the motor neuron to the effector which is the muscle causing the muscle to contract and lift the knee you have to know that and it's one of the things that if you you have to know the diagram as well so learn the diagram and you'll know the diagram and the theory that goes with it people just with regard to drugs, you have to know and read up, and it'll be in your textbooks. If not, go onto the internet. You must know about Dacha and heroin and Tuck. I mean, who in their right mind would take Tuck? But anyway, I mean, we're talking about a reasonable person. But um, cocaine, and you need to know the effects of those drugs on your body or on a person's body and how it messes up their lives. All right, we don't have time to go through it because this section normally gets done over two weeks. I'm trying to do it in an hour and a half here or an hour and 15 minutes. So we're moving on to the nervous, the autonomic nervous system because we've done the central, we've done the, uh, uh, um, we haven't done, we get to the peripheral as well. So autonomic nervous system, it works automatically, okay? It functions involuntarily, people, and automatically, and it is not controlled by the will. It maintains, now this is exceptionally important, homeostasis. All right, homeostasis is the balance that we have within our bodies. So we maintain that balance, okay, by, through the autonomic nervous system. And what do we do? We have nerves that are connected um, to the hypothalamus of the central nervous system. Remember I said to you, the hypothalamus is what controls everything in your body. Every single thing in your body is controlled by that hypothalamus. Now the autonomic nervous system is divided into sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Now remember, as I said to you earlier, sympathetic will stimulate and the parasympathetic will relax or inhibit. So, do they do the same thing? No. They do the opposite thing. So therefore we say they work antagonistically. Look at this word. And please, you must know this word. You can't say it works opposite. It works antagonistically. And the fact that we may have one organ, and coming into that organ we've got sympathetic uh, um, nerves and on this side we've got parasympathetic nerves coming or carrying a sympathetic stimuli and parasympathetic information. The same organ has both. We call that double innervation. Double coming from opposite sides, innovation. And you have to know this term as well. Okay, so. Your autonomic nervous system has two systems. It's divided into two, sympathetic, parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system will stimulate an organ, and that same organ will be inhibited or relaxed by the parasympathetic nervous system. They work antagonistically. They work against each other, antagonistically. All right. And the fact that an organ has nerve uh, 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 impulses coming in from the autonomic, from the sympathetic, and from the parasympathetic, we call that double innervation. Okay? Sympathetic will stimulate, the parasympathetic will slow, and with the fact that we have both systems going into one organ, we call that double innervation. I've just gone through that. Organs are stimulated or inhibited by the autonomic nervous system. Now, I haven't got time, I'm running out of time at a rapid rate here to go through this, but here are just a couple of examples. The pupil of the eye, sympathetic will dilate, make it bigger, and the parasympathetic will constrict. Um, you think of someone when they're really angry, what have they got? They've got a lot of adrenaline going through their bodies. And you know how they say people see red when they get very cross? They actually do. 
The reason for that is that the, the pupil will dilate. It opens so that you, your perception is better to pick up movement. And with that, you've got so much light going in that the retina is overstimulated and then you see little red spots or you see red. Okay, and it, it's quick, it's, it just, it goes within a second. In fact, less than a, a milli, millisecond. Okay, but it's because the pupils dilate. Pupils, parasympathetic pupils are constricted, they're normal. Sweat glands, when they are stimulated, you have lots of sweat secretion. When people are nervous, they sweat lots. Okay, decrease sweat secretion when it's parasympathetic. And so we carry on. Um, uh, one that's very important, heart rate will increase heart rate decreases when you're chilled, when you're relaxed, okay? Arteries of the skin, people, you must know this. We have vasoconstriction, the skin will go pale, why? The blood vessels pull away from the skin and that's what causes people to be pale when they've had a really big fright, okay? Or you have vasodilation and you get a normal skin color. So you need to wee because the bladder, bladder contracts, or parasympathetic, it relaxes and everything's cool. Okay, now, here's just a very pretty diagram to show you, there's the brain, you've got the central nervous system, you've got um, all the organs that are stimulated via sympathetic and those same organs are then relaxed or inhibited from working as fast by the parasympathetic. It's actually sad, I don't have time. Okay, peripheral nervous system. The peripheral, you've got the central, remember, brain and the spinal cord that's the central nervous system okay then you have the peripheral nervous system which comes in from the senses your 31 nerves that sit inside the spinal cord okay so your peripheral nervous system how does it work it's made up of sensory cells called receptors okay when the receptors are stimulated they convert that stimulus into an impulse. And the impulse is transmitted along sensory neurons to the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. If you are in danger, okay, um, what happens? And the body's in danger of being hurt, you will have a reflex arc, which will result in a reflex action. Okay, something gets in your nose, you go, hachoo. What's that? You sneeze. It's a reflex action. You try and stop a sneeze. You cannot stop a sneeze. Um, yawning is a reflex action. All right, so those are things that a baby can do. So it's not learned, it's natural. Um, then your types of receptors, extero receptors. Extero means outside. Okay, so these are receptors from the outside. Those are going to be your five senses. Your skin, your nose, your tongue, your eyes, and your ears. Okay, photoreceptors are light so that's what you're going to have in your eye chemoreceptors you can smell chemicals because everything you smell is made up of chemicals okay it's the chemicals that are in vapor or gas form and taste taste is chemicals but in liquid form so your taste buds on your tongue and your uh, olfactory cells in your nose are receptors for they call chemoreceptors. You've got your mechanoreceptors. They're sensitive to changes of pressure, touch, gravity, etc. And that will be your ears. That's what keeps you standing upright. When you have an ear infection, you lose your balance. So think about it, people. This is a living subject. It's about you, 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 you sitting there. You just have to go stand and look in the mirror. And everything we're doing now with the nervous system, it's you. So ears, you've got ears, skin muscles and your tendons all of them pick up pressure changes touch if somebody touches you softly or they hold you hard or they grab you or they stick a pin in you um, all of those things you're going to pick up in your skin and your muscles okay intero receptors inside and your intero receptors respond to chemical and physical changes inside the body. Why? We want to maintain homeostasis. What's homeostasis? It's a balance. When one goes up, the other one comes down and then we fix it and we pick that one up and we pull this one down. So it's always doing this and there is normal. 
So you're going from high to low to high to low and eventually everything equals out and averages out to be normal. Now, your intero receptors, you're going to have chemoreceptors and we, we are they? In your, look here, your aortic arch, um, your aortic arch as the aorta comes out of the heart and the carotid arteries, which are those arteries that if you put your two fingers here, never your thumb, you've always got a heartbeat in your thumb, just these two fingers and you feel in here, you can feel your heart beating. Now that's your carotid artery and you have one on either side. They're right behind your esophagus. Uh, I mean your, your trachea. Okay? And they pick up incorrect pH levels in the blood. Um, you've got, and that regulates your breathing by the way, because if you have too much carbon dioxide, your blood will be acidic. If you have too much oxy oxygen, your blood will be alkaline. You must remember homeostasis is like um, Goldilocks and the three bears. Mommy bear's porridge was too cold, daddy bear's porridge was too hot, baby bear's porridge was just right. So it, it, your body does this all the time. There's this balance. Thermoreceptors, people, temperature. And where do we pick up temperature? Well, the skin and the hypothalamus will pick up what is inside and going on with the blood. Osmoreceptors are sensitive to changes of osmotic pressure. Osmoreceptors is for water. It's water, the water balance, osmo, water. Baroreceptors, now come on, those of you that do geography know that a barometer is used to measure pressure. So your baroreceptors are going to pick up blood pressure. And your proprioreceptors, they respond to any kind of gravitational pull, so you know where gravity is. And people that are very good gymnasts will have very good prior receptors because they know exactly where their body is in relation to gravity that's why they can tumble and, and gymnasts and circus people okay disease and then we almost finished we have to look at one disease and I chose Alzheimer's why Alzheimer's because I think it's a very sad disease what happens here is you end up with a reduced alpha activity in the brain and remember any kind of brain functioning is measured by an EEG now we have two key parts of the brain that are affected and that's your frontal lobe and the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex. So people, the frontal lobe is here. This is where your higher, higher intelligence, logic, memory sits here. Everything you've learned sits here, okay? Think about it. Whenever anybody, and I say think about it, whenever anybody's got to remember anything, what do you do? You go... What was that again? Uh, and you touch your temples or you touch the front of your head here. In an exam, have a look around the room. And any learner that's battling will have either their right hand or their left hand touching here. Anywhere here along the head. Why? Because your, your body somehow knows that is where the higher intelligence is. Okay, so what happens is the frontal lobe and the temporal lobes are affected. All right. Now this means, and I want a nice big marker here, this means that the conscious part of the brain, okay, and the hippocampus that produces memory are slowly destroyed. Okay, so what happens is that a person who gets Alzheimer's, the way they know they're getting Alzheimer's is, or, or they actually don't understand, they sort of think I'm being forgetful. Um, how can I be forgetting these things? Why? Because that part of the brain, the memory part, the new memories are being ruined. That's why someone with Alzheimer's will remember photos and family members and people from when they were children. And they forget that they even have their own children. Um, go and see a movie called The Notebook. That is probably the best movie interpretation of what happens to a person with Alzheimer's. It's a beautiful movie. All right, so um, the cells are produced acetylcholine now remember acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter and just now when I was telling you my shark story remember acetylcholine neurotransmitter it begins to deteriorate and when it deteriorates the neurotransmitter it, 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 it's it's that is what it does it's the it's the neurotransmitter that's involved with memory so as a result the neurons function decreases and the neurons die and when they die the brain starts to shrink a bit 
because there is a loss of nerve cells. It's been found that Alzheimer's is passed on genetically. So chances are if your mother's got it or your dad's got it, the chances are you could also end up getting it. Remember, not every, there's always a 25% chance, all right? Because remember, it's, it's a recessive gene. Now, during primary stages of this disease, people become forgetful, they lose their short-term memory. We've gone through this. The advanced stages, the, the patients may not even recognize close family members. Patients lose the ability to speak, read, write, remember all of these things. What are they? They are learned. And anything that you learn is going to be stored here in the frontal lobe across here. Okay, that's where it is. And if you stop producing this, this uh, um, uh, neurotransmitter that helps to make and code that memory, you start, that's why people with Alzheimer's start forgetting about now. Not yesterday, uh, not 10 years ago and 20 years ago, because those memories are already stored. Slowly, those memories also start to break down. Okay, it's a very, very stressful disease. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible disease to have, because slowly but surely you become a baby again. All right, so people, think about how your nervous system works. I want you to get up after this session and stand on with one leg and lift your other leg, your knee up and try and balance and think how does your body what are you what are you doing tonight when you taste your dinner i want you to take each individual thing on your plate and taste it savor it feel the texture um, what does it taste like associate tastes look at the colors when you're watching tv look at the colors um, what are you seeing how is it working start taking note of detail because that is all because of your nervous system taste, touch, smell, your extra receptors, remember your interoreceptors, carotid, artery, uh, um, carotid arteries, aortic arch, they sit there. And what are they doing? In your muscles, what are they doing? They're picking up different processes that are happening so that your body can balance and maintain. Central nervous system, the nervous system is amazing. Remember, central nervous system, brain, spinal cord. Autonomic nervous system is split into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic will stimulate an organ. Parasympathetic will inhibit or relax that organ. <coughs> also remember they work antagonistically. They are not controlled by the will. In other words, they are a reflex. They are not controlled by the will. All right. And we have double innovation. The fact that we have nerves that carry impulses from the, the, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic into one organ, double innovation. And then peripheral nervous system, intraceptors and extraceptors will take the impulses, the sensory neurons, uh, um, the, the, the senses will have receptors, the receptors pick up the stimulus and convert the stimulus into an impulse. Impulse will travel to the central nervous system in a reflex. It will travel to the central nervous system, which is the spinal cord, connect a neuron, motor neuron, and it will cause you to respond immediately. That's that. Go study hard. This is an easy section. Make sure you know your diagrams. All right, have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>